So welcome to um, our, this is going to be recorded anyway, um, our session on Bidding 101. And again, we're joined by the lovely Alison. Um, so she's going to give you a whistle-stop tour of all things that you need to know about bids. Now, we're following on from the first session. So if you haven't already seen that, you can go and see that on our YouTube channel, or it should be below me or above me, however which way it falls. So Alison, over to you. Lovely, right, let me um, just click on the right slide so we can share the screen there. Can you see what I'm seeing? I can. Yep, fantastic, let's go into presentation mode, okay. So make this smaller so I can see you all. Okay, so this is great. So as as you mentioned, this is the, the second of our um, our two taster sessions, um, which are the the pre preliminary training for our practical bidding training program, which begins in January. Um, this will be focused on bid processes, knowledge, skills, practical stuff that you would generally see in the bid management training, of which we're offering two different packages. As a reminder, we did cover this um, last week. Um, the first one is the focused on the vanilla process. So this is about us coming in and delivering generic bid management training to your staff to develop capability. And then the second package is aligned to your organization's processes. So this is slightly different. Um, in this instance, we come in, um, have a look at your process, identify any areas for improvement but also act as a critical friend just in case you need any um, support with the live bids that you might have and uh, as you know that's often helpful when uh, you're up against it lots of time limited resource we can help you. Um, so the aim of our session is to develop a winning mindset. Now, we did touch a lot on this um, last week. And the first few slides that we're going to go through are more of a recap for any of those who didn't attend the session or have forgotten. We all know what it's like. It's the lead up to Christmas. You might just need a refresher. Um, and one of the first things that we're going to cover, rather than just focusing on the critical success factors, and don't worry if you if you don't remember what those are, we will cover them. Um, we want to give you an idea of the types of skills that you probably already have that you can build upon in order to make yourself successful within bid management. So as it says there, these are soft and transferable skills. And what we mean by that is they're not things like um, that are based on qualifications. So this is not about having a bid management qualification. This isn't necessarily necessarily about having an English literature degree. This is about the types of skills that maybe you would include on your CV as a general profile to show the type of worker that you are. And these can be things like working well in a team, being dedicated, being a self-starter. And whilst they all seem a little bit twee when you apply them to other jobs, actually, when it comes to bid management, they are really essential for you to do well. But what we want you to remember is that practice makes perfect. You know, you're going to feel pressured and you're going to feel overwhelmed at the moment. And that's because there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to do. But actually, by applying our critical success factors that we're going to go through and by using the skills that you've already developed, probably whilst you were at school or university or if you've done other jobs before entering bid management. And these are essential for you to be able to apply process as well. And that's why it's key. So um, for those of you who attended the first session, as you know, I like a dictionary definition. I think it makes everything lovely and clear. So critical success factors are a necessary element for an organization or a project to achieve its mission. Now, what we mean by that is when you apply that to yourself, these are certain things that you can have in your locker. So there's certain skills and attributes that you can build within your mindset to help you to become successful as, at bidding. And the way I want you to picture this is like you're building a house. So imagine you're building a house, you know you need the bricks and the water, you know you need all the stuff to go inside it, you know you need windows, doors, etc. But without having strong foundations, you can't build that house. And that's what critical success factors are. So whilst processes and the tasks that you do and the um, products that you develop within bid management might be the bricks and mortar, critical success factors are the foundations that you build these processes on. And that's why they're so key and important. So here's a little recap of um, what we did in Taster Session 1 and then what we're going to do in today's session and how it builds on into our practical bid management training in January. So you see with Taster Session 1, we went through three critical success factors. Now, you 
be mindful that there are more than six critical success factors. But to us, these are the kind of the low hanging fruits. These are the things that you can apply really quickly to get the most amount of benefit, and also to help you apply those processes and become a more effective member of a bid team. So we focused at first um, in last week's session on bite sized activities. And just as a reminder, this is about looking at the task at hand, not getting overwhelmed by it and breaking them down into separate tasks. And last week we used the example of if you have a 2000 word uh, response that you need to create. It's not just about writing the response. There are lots of different tasks involved in that. There's the storyboarding of the solution. There's structuring the response. There's weaving in the wind themes. You might have already done an answer plan. These are different steps that you go through. And rather than focusing on developing the content as a whole, if you focus on the step and what the next step will be, it becomes a much easier task for you to do. The second critical success factor we went through is everyone on a bid plays an important role. And for those of you who remember, we referenced the uh, definition of communism there. And we said how everyone contributes according to their ability. And that's exactly what it's like on a bid management team. What you're doing is even though your task might seem simple, it might seem easy and it might seem like it's a small element of the bid that you're developing. It's really important because it takes time away from the other members of your bid team so they can focus on um, on developing content that's winning, but also applying themselves in the right way. The third critical success factor we went through was planning and following process. And as we all know, and you'll have this drummed into you again and again and again, the better you plan and the more you follow the process, the better the outcome will be. Don't be scared by the processes that are there. Processes are there to help and guide you. And the best way to alleviate any anxiety or feeling overwhelmed about a bid is to understand what the next step will be. And as we mentioned, a good thing about these critical success factors and the skills that we want to try and help you build is you can apply these to everything. There's probably lots of things in your life where you think, actually, if I break this down, it could be a little bit less overwhelming. Or if I plan this effectively, it will definitely be better. So this is part of not just your professional development and hopefully within bid management, but also your personal development as well. So in today's session, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to go through the next three critical success factors. The first being challenge everything. And this is encouraging you to ask questions, not being silly about doing that. The fifth one is learning smart, not hard. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to go through. So what we're trying to try and help you do is learn and understand different ways that you can get that knowledge into your head without it feeling so overwhelming and frustrating. And six, uh, six keep calm and carry on. So the important thing here is to understand that there are you need to be able to make decisions very quickly and they need to be the right decisions. And the only way you can do that is being pragmatic, keeping calm and moving forward without getting flustered. And as we mentioned at the beginning of this session, this is all in the lead up to our Bidding 101 practical bid training, which we're going to start delivering in January. Now, this will be more focused on processes. We're going to be covering things like capture planning, bid management, response planning, writing, all the things that you would normally see within that bid management training. But as we mentioned, there are two different types of training that we offer. It's either going to be a more generic process where we will come in and just deliver the capability to your team, or it will be a training um, program that we specifically tailor to your requirements and your processes, offering improvements and also acting as a critical friend. And just to note, for those of you who are watching this session now or you're watching it on YouTube, but you uh, maybe missed the first session or you would like to recap, we do have that session live on YouTube now. So if you need the link, just let us know and we can send that over to you. Why critical success factors are important. Now, we need to understand why we should be applying these, because otherwise it feels a little bit like, mm, you know, these are a bit high level. They might be a bit twee, but actually there is a there's a huge amount of importance. And I'll refer you back to the analogy I used about critical success factors being the foundations of a house. They're the things that we build on. And the fact is that bids are tough. And we all know that there's no disguising it. And we need to be honest with you now. You know, it's a difficult industry. There's lots of time constraints. There's lots of people that you need to rely on. 
The hours can be long and we all know this, but applying these critical success factors can help you reduce the hours. They can help you tighten up the way that you work and they very much help to reduce the stress and panic that tends to come with bids. And I'm guessing that at the moment, you're probably feeling a bit overwhelmed. I'm imagining that if you're a graduate, you've probably been handed textbooks or you've been handed reams of process, lots of documents, say read through that and then you'll understand it. And we've all been there. And remember that you might be working with bid managers who have 10, 20, 30 years experience. They still get overwhelmed. The difference is that they have the experience to lean on. So whilst you might be looking at a task and thinking, oh, my God, this is this is the end of the world. This seems it's so critical. How am I going to do it? Actually, your bid manager's probably been through that. And the only reason they're so calm is because they know the way out of the situation. And the only way you can get yourself to feel less overwhelmed is by learning and applying these critical success factors. And what I want to do is take you back to the first day you were at uni, the first day you sat down in a lecture hall. And you might have gone from a class of maybe 30, 35 people when you were at school and suddenly you're in a big auditorium with 100, 200, 300 people in there, all vying for attention, all looking like they understand things a lot more than you. They probably didn't. They're probably all in exactly the same situation. But now imagine going back to uni. Now, I don't know about you, but I would love to go back to uni now. I would smash it. There is no chance I would get anything below a first. And reason being is I have this experience. Now the thought of writing a 2000 word essay is not overwhelming. For me, that's an afternoon's work, you know. And when you think about it like that, whilst things feel overwhelming now, situations change. You develop, you become a different person and you use that experience to get yourself there. And one of the ways we can help you get there quicker is by focusing on these critical success factors. So success factor four, challenging everything. This is really important and I can't stress how important. It's probably, in, in my view, one of the most important of the success factors that we go through. And the reason is, is twofold. Not only does it help your personal development, but it's also an integral part of bidding to make sure that we're developing those winning responses. The reason it helps you learn is because asking questions helps you get to the right answer quicker. And whilst we're going to go through some of those, um, those helpful hints and tips of how you can learn better and how you can learn quicker, asking questions is probably the quickest. Because whilst you can go and hunt for that information, if you ask your bid manager a particular question, their answer is going to be focused on the bid, on the process or on the client. And the fact is that that answer could be different any number of times, depending on what bid you're working on. So going to your peers and going to your managers and asking questions is really important for your learning. And you should never feel bad about asking questions. All of them are legitimate. So whilst, as I mentioned, whilst the format of tenders tends to be the same, generally every tender is different. There's lots of different things to consider. Requirements could be similar. It might be the same type of client. They might, might be asking for a similar solution, but there's always subtle differences. The important thing to note about that is there's a lot of things to learn with each bid. You've got the client requirements, you've got the solution that you're posing, you've got the timescales that are involved. It might be that actually you don't have a solution and it needs to be developed. There's terms and conditions involved. There's all this procurement documentation that everyone has to wade through. Even with all the experience in the world, you can't pick up on everything. No one knows all the answers. So what if you notice something that's a red flag? It could be something like um, they're specifically asking for a team of five, but you've settled on delivering a team of three. It could be that there is some kind of clause within the contract that would prohibit you from bidding. But unless someone actually questions that and raises it within the group, how do you know that someone else has picked up on it or not? 
So the fact is, whilst you might think that something is a really stupid, obvious question, it might not be. It might be the key to whether you're going to bid or not bid. It might be the key to winning. It might be that no one else has noticed that there needs to be a team of five. They're pressing on with the team of three. But whilst you're too scared or too um, frightened to ask the question, no one else is picking up on this. And that's why it's important. And we say here, the, the thing is, you might be there's no loss to this situation. You're either going to be heralded, heralded as a hero. Yes, you found the answer. We know we're going to win now because you've identified this, um, this issue or we're not going to bid because we've, you've identified this red flag. And actually, it means you're saving us 15 grand on the price of the bid. There's no wrong scenario in this. There's nothing that will make you look bad. In fact, asking those questions shows that you're diligent. It shows that you're interested and it shows that you're invested in winning the bid. So here's some ways um, that challenging everything improves bids. Um, and this is the type of format we, we like to do with these sessions. So we give you the concept and then we show you some practical ways that you can apply it. Creating winning content. The whole point of a bid process is that it's iterative. We don't expect the right answers to come out straight away. You know, it's great if they do, but everything can always be improved. Asking questions and challenging improves content. And that's what the review process is. You write the content, you have the reviewer come in, they assess it against evaluation criteria and the solution that you're delivering, and then they give you the answers that you need. They challenge it to make sure that you're developing that content in a way that it becomes a winning tender. It's also really important for the bid, no bid decision. Now, you might have two opportunities that are really similar. You might think, yes, we can deliver both of these, but actually you don't have the resource to deliver both bids or both contracts effectively. How do you make that decision over which bid is the right one for you to pursue? The answer is you challenge it. You challenge the requirements, you challenge what they're asking for, you challenge it against the solutions that you're delivering. And that way you know whether it's a viable opportunity or not. Answering the question correctly. Now, this, this is an important one, and it's often one that people miss. And what I'm going to do is ask Raquel to help me with this here. And we're going to do a little exercise where I'm going to show you how um, ambiguity can creep in, even if you think that it's a simple instruction. So Raquel, what I'm going to ask you to do, um, have you got a piece of paper and a pen? Fantastic. <laughs> I want you, and this sounds really simple, but I just want you to draw a square, a circle and a triangle. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing. OK. okay. Yeah. On the, the on the paper, I feel like you're tricking me. <laughs> no, not, not tricking so you. Play my paper. <laughs> yeah, plain white paper, draw a square, a triangle and a circle. That's it. Now I've done the same thing. There's no right or wrong answer, right? No right or wrong answer. Fantastic. So you've done that nice and big in the middle, all in a straight line, haven't you? Yeah. What I've done is done a tiny little version in the <laughs> corner there. Now, that seems like a really simple exercise, but what that illustrates is a simple command can be translated in many, many different ways. Now, when I've done that with people, I've had people try and get really elaborate and think, oh, this is a test. And I've like, done um, squares inside of triangles and done like big circles or, you know, trying well, to colour them in. <laughs> exactly, exactly that. And the thing is, it, it just demonstrates how that seems like a really simple command, but it can be interpreted in so many different ways it's the same as a bid question you know you might have a question that says describe your approach to delivering this solution okay that, that sounds fairly simple doesn't it well all we need to do is say you know we're going to mobilize we're going to this is the solution we develop this is the resource etc 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 but that can be interpreted in so many different ways and that's why we have to ask clarification questions. We ask clarification questions to make sure we're answering the questions in a way that the client wants us to. Ambiguity is the single biggest thing that can probably reduce your scoring on a bid. And 
as we've shown here, there's so much information to process. You think we can we can mistranslate a simple command like a square, a triangle and a circle. So imagine how many things you can interpret differently within those big tender documents. So important to ask questions. Understanding the client, and here we've said about clarification questions, it's really important to understand everything. And it's not just necessarily about asking the questions of the client, but it's also about asking questions around it. It's asking about context. Good example is say if you have a public sector client at the moment. And for those of you who have read any kind of, um, who have read the updated social value policy, I have, of course, um, you would know that there are certain differences in the way that you have to approach social value. But you have to also understand the context around it. Now, um, COVID is a big part, the COVID recovery, making sure that we're demonstrating how we're going to help their local communities with COVID recovery. But you can't get that just from reading the social value questions. You also have to know around the subject, the context in which your client is sitting, so understanding the market. And again, the only way you can do that is by researching and asking the right questions. Learn smart, not hard. This is important for time saving. There's lots to do on bids, as we've mentioned. And as you can see here from this graphic, which we use fairly often, there's so much to learn. And the subtleties between the differences of, the di of uh, what we have to learn is really, really important. You need to know about writing. You need to know about processes, procurement, project management, markets, responsibilities. It all becomes really overwhelming because there's so much that you need to try and retain. But what, what I want to do is focus your attention back to critical success factor one, bite sized activities. And it's here that we can start to see how the critical success factors interrelate and how they're interdependent on each other. The fact is that you can apply these bite sized activities to your learning as well. So it's not about learning the whole process. It's not about learning everything there is to do with the procurement or the market that you're delivering to. Actually, you can break it down into three key areas. The first thing you need to do is understand the task that you're doing right now. Of course, that's important because otherwise, how are you going to do it? So you need to know how to learn that task. You then need to know how that task fits into the process. And that helps with your planning because you know, OK, from this step, I need to complete it to this level and then we're going to move on to the next step. And again, the, the example I like to use here is the writing and review, because that's a really easy example. You write, you review, you write, you review. You also need to understand why the task is important and why it adds value. And understanding that helps you to know the expectation. It helps you to know what's expected of you in that task. And as we keep saying, remember that practice makes perfect. We're not expecting you to know all the answers right now. No one does, even if people proclaim to. And I know I do on a daily basis. I don't know the answers to all the questions. It's about making sure you're nice and calm, making sure you're learning what you need to know and when. Saying that, we've got some top tips for you. These are some of the ways that are some of the things that I've put into um, practice that have helped me learn really quickly. Now, most people don't learn from textbooks. If you throw textbooks at people and reams of paper and reams of process, nine times out of 10, they're not going to retain that knowledge. Using myself as an example, I'm dyslexic, yet I have an English literature degree. The reason I have an English literature degree is I had ev all of my books read onto um, audio for me. Now, this was before audio books. This was before audio. So bless her. My mum read all of my texts onto MP3 for me so I could listen to them on computer. Um, actually, to be fair, I'm of that age where I think they were CDs that she might have burned them onto. Um, but nevertheless, the reason she did that is because um, she knew and understood that me reading something takes ages. Like it might take someone a day to read a, um, I don't know, uh, a couple of chapters of a textbook. That might take me a week. And that's just because I'm dyslexic. So I listen to everything. I make sure that I'm asking questions all the time because I know if I get an audio response um, as an answer to a question, I'm going to retain that. It's locked in. It's done. So some of the top tips that we have for you. Learn from comments and feedback. 
it's really important. Don't see it as a personal attack. Don't take comments and feedback personally. Everyone is aiming at winning. And that's really key and it's important to remember. So whilst you might see loads of red lines, you might see loads of comments if you're writing some content, you know, you might get feedback saying, can you change this template in this way? Can you do this? Can you do that? Learn from it. It's like a lessons learned process. Take it, evaluate it, understand it, and then use it. And inevitably, by taking on comments and feedback, it makes every subsequent bid a little bit better. And it also adds value to the work that you're doing. Create a knowledge bank. I remember when I first started in bid management, um, I had a little notebook where I basically wrote down all key terms that I knew I was asking for loads and loads and loads. So there will be certain things that you ask for repeatedly on each bid those things, pop them in a Bible. Now, you can use folders. It can just be various documents that you've identified as being really helpful. Um, it could be information that you've researched. Note it all down in one place so you know where to go to for that information quickly. Google everything. I love Google. People don't, people undervalue Google, I think, and it's often seen as a kind of a cheat's way to get information, but it saves time to cheat. Go on to Google and there's so many different ways that you can use it. I find that it's really good for definitions, templates, outlines. The fact is it's been around a while now and it's often the case that someone has probably developed that template. You're thinking, oh, I need a um, I need a bid management plan. There's probably one on Google. There's probably a free template, you know, if you wanted to start there. It's always easier to start from a template than it is from scratch. One tip I found is if you're someone who learns visually, go in and type in a process. You could type in generic bid management process. Then type um, and then if you click on photos and images, it will just show you an outline of a process and you can use that and chuck that in your Bible. That's something that you can then reference. It might be that you look at that and think, actually, do you know what? I can now draw out my process that I have um, that my organization has given me. The read aloud function on Word is the single best thing I've ever had pointed out to me. And as I say, this is because I'm dyslexic, so I tend to learn from by listening. And the read aloud function, also you can use it on Outlook. Um, there's a read aloud version on PDFs. And there's also various different um, applications that you can buy where you can apply it to different um, systems, like say if, um, if you're using something else that isn't Word. And the good thing about this is you can speed it up. So where it might take you three hours to read through all the procurement documents that you get sent, actually you can just listen to them on Read Aloud. You can make notes at the same time, you can annotate. So it's, an, it's a really good way of you being able to disseminate information really quickly and test yourself. And whilst we've said that asking questions is really important and challenging is really important, I understand that you might be someone who's not there yet. You might not be confident enough to ask questions. So a really good way to know if you're asking the right questions is to test yourself. No one's going to know if you get the answer wrong. So there's no need to be embarrassed. All you need to do is have a look at the work you're doing. Try and identify what it is that you're finding difficult. See if you can go away and research those things. Is there anything else that you can do to help yourself? If the answer is no, that's the question you then take to your manager. And I also want you to remember critical success factors three and four, planning and process and challenge everything. So planning and process is key here because what you need to do is start building in time for your learning. Yes, there's a lot of pressure. Yes, you're expected to do various tasks in short time scales, but actually it's it's important for you to build in that time for your learning. And actually, it doesn't take long. It might be that you've been given a task and you think, uh, I can't remember how I do that. So you build in 10 minutes at the beginning to go away and look at your Bible. You build in 10 minutes to go away and look at Google, go and have a look at some other documents, read around the subject. So you know exactly what it is that you need to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, as a manager myself, um, if someone comes to me and says, actually, I think this task is going to take me an hour, but I'm going to give myself two hours because I want to really understand what it is that I need to do and plan effectively first. Great. You're an essential part of the team. You're taking this seriously. It's all good things that you can apply. 
And our final critical success factor, keep calm and carry on. It does sound cheesy, doesn't it? It's one of those things we say it often. There are so many memes for keep calm and carry on, but it is essential. And the reason for that is timescales are short. We don't have a lot of time. And the more you progress throughout your bid team and throughout your bidding career, you need to be able to ask um, to um, keep calm and make the right decisions quickly. And that's key. Imagine it's two in the morning. You're working on a bid. You're not sure what the next step is. Actually, keeping calm is essential there. You keep calm. You think about what it is that you're doing and it helps you to progress in the right direction. And I'll bring your attention back now to the decision quicksand that we spoke about in the um, in our first session last week. The principle of it is if you think something is going to be difficult, inevitably it will be. So you need to go into every bid thinking, actually, do you know what? I can do this. I've got the skills to do this. The tasks that I'm doing are helping my bid team. And I'm going to take you back now to when you started uni. And we've used this um, we've used this analogy before, but it's really crucial and it's worthwhile. Knowing what you know now, wouldn't it be easier if you went back? You wouldn't find it overwhelming. You wouldn't find those 2000 word essays daunting because you know how to approach it. You know how to manage your time. You know how to keep calm and you know how to progress through it. So here's some ways to keep calm. A bid is essentially a big piece of comprehension. And that's all it is. So remember when you were at school um, and you were either, I can't remember if it was English language or English literature, but it was one of the English classes. And your teacher gives you a page of writing. And your task is to read through it, to analyze it, and answer questions on it. That's a bid. And now that doesn't seem so daunting, does it? Actually, all you're doing is reading through the documents. And yes, we've always got that gripe that the procurement documents could be better. They could be less ambiguous. They could have more information in. But actually, they're telling you the solution that they want. They're telling you the requirements that you need. So all you need to do is read through it, understand it, and apply it to the question. Communicate with everyone. If you're feeling frustrated, nine times out of 10, everyone else on your bid team is feeling frustrated as well. So talk to your peers. You don't necessarily have to talk to your bid manager, you know, if you feel uncomfortable with it or you don't want to raise something, but you should at least talk to the other members of your team because they will probably be feeling the same as you. And it might very well be that if they've got more experience, they can help you. They can make you feel less overwhelmed by the situation. Everyone makes mistakes and don't take feedback personally. These ones probably go hand in hand. But don't let mistakes phase you. We've mentioned this already. It's not about being perfect. It's not about giving everyone the right answer immediately. Actually, it's about how you use that feedback. Don't take it personally because everyone is aiming for the win. This isn't an attack on you. This isn't someone giving you feedback saying you're rubbish. You're not worth this. You are. You've been selected to be on this bid team. You've probably been interviewed with hundreds of other graduates and you're the one that they chose. So someone else sees that in you. So don't take it personally. Actually, what they're doing, if people are reviewing your work and giving you feedback, is giving you a really quick way to develop yourself. Plan regular breaks. I'll be honest. I never used to do this and I only started doing this probably within the last couple of years, but it's so helpful. Even if it's just five minutes, take a break. Now, there's often instances where you get stuck on something. It might be that you're mapping requirements. It might be that you're trying to think of a clarification question. It might be that you're sitting in front of re a response. You know the answer, but you can't just start writing because there's, there's so much around you. You've done all your research. You've got all the bits that you need everywhere. Take five minutes. Often the answer's there. It's just that you're so close to the project that you can't see it. And taking that time, taking a breather, taking a step back, relaxing yourself is often easier and it saves time rather than you sitting there frustrated thinking, how am I going to start this response? How do I phrase this clarification question? Just take two minutes, step away, come back. I guarantee you that the answer will be right in front of you and allowing yourself that space will help you.
So that seemed to go pretty quick, didn't it? <laughs> so that's all of the <laughs> six. Uh, <laughs> that's all of the um, the six critical success factors that we're covering. Um, as we've mentioned, these um, sessions are going up on YouTube. The first taster session is up already. Um, but obviously, if you wanted to have um, a more in-depth discussion about how you can apply these in different methodologies, we, uh, we're happy to help you there. And this is the uh, foundations for our Bidding 101 practical bid training uh, program, which we will start developing in January. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, well, that's for our sessions this year, 2021. Wowza. <laughs> what a way to finish. Um, we've brought it all, all together. So thank you, Alison, for giving us a run yeah. through. We'll have a link up uploaded on our YouTube channel. So get logged on. We will be sharing it on up as part of our Use These Better group on LinkedIn as well. So for those of you that aren't already joined, um, get registered and we can allow access. It is a private group, but we have built up this community. Go and have an amazing Christmas and a really, really good new year, everyone. Thank you. See you later.